So this is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 31 million... Uh, 536,000 seconds. That's the number of seconds in a year. How do I know that fact? Because my neighbor told me. And why did my neighbor tell me? And why does he know? Because every December 26th at midnight, he literally resets a timer to count down to the next Christmas. <laughs> That's how much he loves Christmas. And he can tell you at any point how many seconds until the next Christmas. Now, my friend, uh, admittedly, while he loves Christmas, uh, he doesn't love the Christ of Christmas. We've had talks about faith, and he doesn't love Christ. Um, in our culture, there's something what I'll call a, a pseudo-Christianity. And that's the great irony of our modern-day culture. Trevor did well to just bring some of that out in, in his emceeing. Um, where we don't actually embrace the namesake of Christianity, which is Christ, Christ Jesus, the one in history who truly is the Son of God and the Savior to take away our sins. Now, the irony is that, um, hopefully this doesn't distract you for the rest of the sermon, but here's a wonderful steak that's marinating, okay? I want to use that as an analogy. Uh, our world and especially Western civilization, has been marinating in Christianity for a long time. That's how one of my friends puts it. And meaning, um, even non-Christian historians willing to acknowledge that uh, the West has been built on Christianity. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we look out on our culture that we see a lot of things that resemble Christianity. They kind of look like Christianity. A quick example, you've probably heard a lot these days, especially when our culture is prioritized as self-care, that we just need to find a way to love ourselves, right? To accept yourself unconditionally. Or we hear phrases like, you're, you're perfectly imperfect. And so we try to love each other and ourselves that way. That is a shade of the message of God's unconditional love that our culture has been marinating in for a long time. It sounds like, it looks like God's grace through Christ Jesus and his gospel. And so we, that's what we mean by this pseudo-Christianity notion. And, and so, like my neighbor and, and our culture, we want the things of sort of the benefits and blessings of Christianity, but we literally throw the baby not only out with the bathwater, but the manger. 
We hear so many messages of Christmas, even as you go to the malls and so forth. Literal Christian hymns and carols are being played through the speakers, and there's this facade of Christianity. And we find cheer and hope in the bright lights set against the dark nights, but we lack faith in the Christ of Christmas. So in contrast, that's why all the more today, what I hope will stick with you is uh, this big thought. So faith comes from hearing, and what we really need to hear is the word of Christ. These are actually Paul's words from Romans 10, 17, but they agree so closely with, I think, the gist of what Luke wants us to catch from what church history is called the Annunciation, uh, meaning announcing to Mary how God will bring uh, the Savior of the world into the world through her. And I hope that um, by the end of our time in the Word, uh, that there might be a prayer of faith, something like this. Lord, help me to respond to your Word with faith, not just to hear it and for it to make sense and then come out the other ear, but to respond by faith to your Word and to follow Jesus and live this out like Mary. So I want to ask for the rest of our time together, how does God create faith in us? I think what we see going on here underneath it all is a picture of how God creates faith. And in short, it's by his word, his Holy Spirit taking God's word and making it come alive, creating something. That's the power of God's word. And I want to draw out just uh, three things. There's obviously always so much more. God's word is so rich and beautifully dense. Um, But today, I hope to show you that our minds need to be humbled Uh, Our stories need to be directed, and our hearts need to be spiritually reborn, all of these things by God's Word. So first, our minds need to be intellectually humbled by God's Word. Uh, Intellectual humility is a difficult hurdle in following Jesus. It's a hurdle that you have to get over if you're gonna actually follow Christ, okay? Now in our world today, um, intellectual humility is very difficult. I'll get to just why it's difficult in a second, but intellectual humility, it's important because if you're a gardener or if your family ever farmed or whatnot, you'll know the importance of tilling the soil, making it uh, loose and healthy so that nutrients and water and oxygen can get in there. And so intellectual humility is like the tilling of the mind and soul to receive the seeds of the gospel and for it to take root. Now, it's difficult for us today because we live as time, every second that ticks away, our our culture, our world only becomes more advanced scientifically, medically, technologically, just whatever information, we're just increasing information. We live in the day of internet, the age of internet. And so if we're honest, we might not say it this way, but there's a spirit in us that we feel like we're God. I mean, even with AI and so forth, it's really just man trying to also, in some sense, be God, to create another sentient being, so to speak. And we believe we can figure everything out. And if it doesn't make sense according to our framework or our knowledge, then we question whether it should be believed. Love how the late John Stott just got right to the heart of the matter when he said, Pride, however, is your greatest enemy, and humility is your greatest friend. And today's passage, today's scene, this Christmas scene, it's an invitation to have that humility. Christmas is a time to be reminded to have this kind of humility. Um, Paul himself, before we get to Luke, he says it in this way, writing to Timothy, his protege, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Why? For people will be lovers of self, certainly describes the times today, lovers of money. Now, I want to especially highlight these characteristics that Paul warns us of. Proud, arrogant, these other characteristics, and ungrateful. The pride, arrogance, being ungrateful, it's usually symptoms of, of 
that I know it all. I don't need God. I, I don't need to humble myself. And so we come to today's passage, Luke chapter 1, and we pick up in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. Now for us as listeners and readers of the Bible in 2023, this right away demands intellectual humility. Because for us, the things of angels and things sent from God, even our nation itself, and some of our laws, our bills, says this is all myth. It takes an intellectual humility to acknowledge, first, an angel, and second, an angel sent from God. But in these first Christmas stories, as recorded in Luke and the other Gospels, this is part of the original Christmas story, we see that the first Christmas challenges us intellectually. Being intellectually humble, I want to comfort you and encourage you, reassure you, it doesn't mean being stupid. It doesn't mean being ignorant or unscientific. On the contrary, being intellectually humble means you're smart enough to know that you can't know everything. And even though perhaps you and I have not seen an angel, that in that spirit, we don't need to just drink the water of our culture, of our culture's Kool-Aid, and just reduce the Christmas story to myth and rejecting it as history. I mean, if just starting with Jesus, he's history. That, that's, it's hard to argue against that. And so if you just work backwards in his life, and this is a record of his life, and this is history, and, and so the, the attitude that we're supposed to have is more just how, how, can this make sense? How can this build me up? How can I believe this? How can this expand my understanding of who God is and so forth? And so as Wayne Grudem says, I love how he identifies that every human being, if, if they're honest, when it's just yourself and your thoughts, you're quiet, there is some inner sense of God. There truly is an inner sense of God. Now before you know that it's Jesus and the Father and the Spirit, before perhaps you're given the scriptures and exposed to the scriptures, you might call it the transcendent, you might call it the universe, but whatever, there's this inner sense of something divine, a sense of God speaking to us. And so I want us to think about it like the difference between something that's presently inexplainable versus not understandable, okay? Just because something is not understandable doesn't mean that it's inexplainable. Just to appeal to our own history as humans, 1903, before 1903, you would have told me that I'm crazy if I said, I believe we can fly. And of course, you know, the Wright brothers, they were able to discover flight. Or just fast forward, before 2001, you might have been incredulous if I told you about this little doohickey that is the phone, the internet, plays music and a video player and captions music all at once. You probably might have thought, no, that, that's crazy. That will never happen, right? So just because we can't explain it in the present doesn't mean it's, it can't happen. And I could go on and on and on about this kind of, just, you know, reality. Now, there's another way that we see humility in today's passage as we continue in the six months, the angel Gabriel was sent from God, and here, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And this can't be looked over. The fact that God begins to just unhatch his plan, to, to unfold his amazing plan of redemption, just to really get the ball rolling in a momentous way in history through Jesus, that he makes the setting humble Nazareth. Galilee itself was, was uh, just a more humble region of Israel as well. And then it's like there's already sort of a humble region or a poor region. And then in that poor region, the poorest of the poor was Nazareth. It wasn't looked well upon. And there God decides to unfold his plan, to have Joseph and Mary there. And Jesus growing up in this place. God looks past the powerful, ornate cities of Rome and Jerusalem and said, 
sets his heart on a backwater poor shanty town called Nazareth. So the point is this. God loves humility. Christmas, if we're going to take in Christmas and celebrate and appreciate it in the way that God wants us to, it needs to renew a sense of humility and wonder before God. That's why as we come to verse 28, again, just we see even more humility. And he came to her, angel Gabriel, bringing God's message and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And so we see that she's greatly troubled at the same. Now, I think one way to appreciate what's going on here is that even Mary is being intellectually humbled. Her conception and understanding of God is being blown up. Just in in this short sentence alone, the fact that God, who is, remember, Mary's history, his, her, her heritage, her people experienced God at Sinai. And it was dark, dark clouds, lightning, and, and so much, so afraid, saying to Moses, we're afraid you go and speak to God, only have God speak to you and not to us because we can't handle this. It, it, it's, it's too fear striking and he's too holy. We can't approach him. And so we shouldn't be surprised that Mary is troubled because here is a messenger of the Lord giving a personal greeting and it's a warm one. Oh, favored one. This just literally means, oh, graced one. If God did not make it clear enough, even in through the law and the prophets and the Psalms, that he certainly is a God of grace, now he's making it all the more clear to Mary, I come to you in grace. And the Lord is with you. The Lord is your friend. The infinite, incomprehensible, meaning there's just, we'll never know everything about God because he's infinite. This God of the universe makes himself known warmly, graciously, and personally to lowly Mary. And that's the invitation of Christmas to you and me. To be able to humbly think and be willing to admit, yeah, there's, I, I can't understand everything, but praise God for what he does let me know about him. And so again, we shouldn't be surprised that Mary is troubled and Gabriel, like a good counselor, knows what's going on inside her heart. And so he speaks directly to what's going on inside her heart. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found, again, favor, grace with God. So don't miss the true meaning of Christmas, okay? Take this time again, this Advent season, to be humbled, and perhaps even intellectually. Perhaps you have questions, and it's not to say that you just turn off your brain and and not think about those things, but to come with a humble posture, a humble attitude. Okay, God, you explain to me how to understand the world. If I have questions about angels and so forth, help me to understand them through what you've revealed in Scripture. At Christmas, we would be remiss if we don't approach God, the Father, Jesus, the newborn Christ, the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures with the spirit of humility and open-hearted and open-mindedness to just a fresh wonder. Well, next, our stories need to be directed by God's story. And what I mean by this is, just let me throw out sort of an analogy at you. I don't know if you've ever been an actor in a play or a movie or whatnot, but certainly we can appreciate good movies. And, and so what's behind there are these actors, and there's a director who's directing. And so maybe you've even seen the scenes of a director trying to pull an actor aside, give me more, you know, sadness, or give me more, whatever it is, and, and directing and, and trying to make the story unfold in the way he envisions. That's what we uh, mean here by our stories need to be directed by God's word. Christmas is a time for our stories to be re-anchored first in, in God's ultimate story, his overarching narrative of redemption. And Christmas is a time to believe 
whether for the first time, I hope there might be someone here today who believes for the first time, or to be renewed in our belief that all our foundations, all our hopes, they ultimately find their source and fulfillment in Jesus. That's the invitation of Christmas, okay? Now, where do we see this? As we continue along in the passage, and behold, this is Gabriel explaining to Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus here, his name alone is the gospel because it means the one who saves. So even Jesus' name is an expression of the gospel. But what we see here and what we need to appreciate is that, and God does this many times as you look through Scripture, he, he often works on a literal level, but oftentimes what's literal behind that, there's a spiritual meaning, a spiritual metaphor that's meant to encourage our lives. Literally, we're being told that Jesus will be fashioned in Mary's womb like any other baby in a mother's womb. Spiritually, metaphorically speaking, Mary is being made aware that the longing, and we know that part of why she responded in, with such faith is she longed for the Messiah like any good Jew, any good Hebrew, any good person, uh, a member of the people of God. And so God is forming spiritually, metaphorically, that fulfillment of the one who saves. Of, of the Messiah that's going to reconcile all things, vindicate all things, resolve all things. And so from deep within Mary, from her womb, her gut, and all those who believe, God conceives, God creates that longing to be saved, a longing for Jesus, the one who indeed saves. Now this, just to draw out the beauty of all that, just to refer to Hebrews chapter 2. I love how Hebrews puts it. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect. Meaning Jesus is made perfect through his suffering. For he who sanctifies, those who are sanctified, and those who are sanctified all have one source. See, what I'm trying to, Support here is Hebrews does a be- creates a beautiful picture. See, in Mary, both literally and spiritually, Jesus is born. Meaning, first, literally, the God, man, Jesus, that's how he comes into the world. But also this faith in the one who can save. And therefore, we see that through that, that God's intention is to spiritually bring new birth to many more sons of glory. And these sons, these children, sons and daughters of glory, that you and I are to grow up, to be sanctified, and we all have one source, meaning Christ. And so that's why, to go back to Luke 1, Gabriel continues to explain, he will be great in Jesus, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, the Son of God, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so here's where we really begin to see now that our stories need to be directed by God's word. Mary's being comforted as she's trying to figure out her life, as she's trying to navigate the, now it's going to be very fragile engagement with Joseph. She's trying to navigate all the relationships and and just people's perception and so forth, that she's trying to do life. We know Joseph and Mary were poor, and so she's navigating her life financially and economically. But in all that, what is her deepest longing is to be part of the story of God's people, to be redeemed. We know from other places in Luke that there was this general theme, this common longing for the redemption of Israel. And and Mary, I I don't doubt that that was probably as as a true Jew, She was longing for this story to unfold. And so Gabriel gets right to it. God, the Lord God, he's going to bring the story of Israel, this broken story of Israel, to full fruition. 
He's going to bring it full circle. He's going to resolve it. But it's not just about Israel. This Messiah will not only take the throne of his father David, his ancestor David, but of his kingdom there will be no end. We know from other scriptures that really God had in sight to invite all those across the whole world, any who would place faith in Jesus to be a part of this story. And so we know, and Luke, he brings it out strongly here and there in his gospel, that it's not only about the redemption of the story of Israel, but ultimately the redemption of the fallen story of Adam and all humanity. Okay? And the encouragement is also of our stories as we place faith in him. Now, there's a real important uh, doctrine, theology, uh, just the thought that we need to really take away from this. And so when we say Jesus Christ, when we call out to our Lord or say his name or praise his name, Jesus Christ, what Gabriel's teaching Mary here is, is some of the most glorious theology in history, namely Jesus' incarnation. When we say Jesus Christ, we're actually talking about, whether you realize it or not, you're, you're talking about the fact that Jesus is perfect man and perfectly God come together. When you say Jesus, primarily referring to Jesus as the Son of Man, just think of Jesus that way, that he's, that's the human. When you say Christ, you're primarily referring to Jesus now as that divine Son of God. And we know that there's this beautiful, mysterious way that God brings these both together to make it not only Jesus, not only Christ, but Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus, this human, who is also divine, and he's the Son of God. Now, this is so important for us, and I really want to just spend a little time here so that you understand it, because we needed not just Jesus, not just Christ, but we needed Jesus Christ because we need a Savior who can do two things perfectly. First, we need a Savior who represents us perfectly as humans. And that's why we know Jesus, as he lived this human life and experienced every weakness that we do, that he was truly one of us, and he really represents us. And so when he substitutes us on the cross, he really is substituting us as a human. But second, we need a Savior who's truly sinless. Because there have been plenty of noble, altruistic beings in history who've laid down their lives for others, but they don't count in God's eyes as being a perfect sacrifice for sin. Because why? They weren't perfect. They had their own sin and issues in their own life. And so second, we need a Savior who's truly sinless, who is not like us, and because he's sinless, he truly becomes that satisfactory sacrifice in God's eyes. I want you to see it. I hope you'll see it with me. Jesus brings God's story of redemption and man's broken story back together again. Okay? It's only in this Jesus that we can really find the full resolution of all our brokenness and God directing his story and bringing about this full Redemption. And, and so if you really understand, if, 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 it, if you let it sink in, Jesus' incarnation, that it's Jesus Christ, this also becomes a very practical comfort to you. Right? This is God's gift to you at Christmas, that, that you could be comforted. Christmas speaks to your suffering if you'll let Jesus Christ into your life. Because he's the God that meets us in our suffering. In his humanity, he understands and he truly has a purpose for your suffering that will gloriously prevail beyond death. Christmas speaks to our hurts, frustrations, and disappointments because as we really let Jesus Christ and his incarnation sink into our hearts, then there's an eternal hope that is greater than your unmet earthly hopes. And Jesus' incarnation says 
that he understands that. And he's going to resolve all that. And if we let the incarnation really sink in, it becomes a comfort where we're deeply reminded that our story will find its truest meaning and happiest conclusion in Christ. If you look at the, on the world, the headlines, the wars, the sicknesses, the crimes, the injustices, the immorality, produces a weariness, doesn't it? A weariness. And all this points all the more to a longing for God to act but we can begin to have hope when, and we see that God has started acting when we see Jesus Christ. He really has entered just the brokenness of this life and he has begun to unfold towards his final sure conclusion that he'll resolve all things, he'll vindicate all things. Well, finally, our hearts need to be spiritually reborn by God's word. And what we mean by this is that God's word creates faith. God speaks, and it is. I love in verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And so what we see here is that what's actually going on, Mary responds to God's word. That's the dynamic here. That's the action. Mary responds to God's word. God speaks his word. He speaks his gospel through Gabriel. He speaks Jesus' name. And so God's word is central here. And Mary responds by faith to God's word. God speaks. And we see that here it is. He creates something in Mary. Not only literally creating uh, the, the baby Jesus in her womb, but spiritually creating faith in Christ. A faith in Christ is born in her. And this is something that has to go on uh, in our lives. Now here's, God gives us a window into how he does this. Going back to verse 34, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God, for nothing will be impossible with God. Now, let's back up first. Verse 34, I love that she asks questions. Now, she's different from Zechariah. We know that Zechariah, when the angel visited him and the angel was unfolding and explaining God's plan to him, that he also asked questions, but the angel discerned his heart as not believing. Now, whether not believing but here we see Mary, that she was full of faith, and so it's more how. She already expects this to happen, but how, God, how, how will God do this? Okay? But the point is, questions are good. Even if you don't believe, or you have someone in your life who doesn't believe, and they're asking questions, hopefully God in his mercy will lead that person like he did to Zechariah from unbelief to belief. Or perhaps you have a person in your life who, like Mary, is asking questions. Pick up on those and be encouraged if there are people around you that are asking questions. Nurture those spiritual conversations. But what we see here now is something even more beautiful and powerful. And here, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. This, this should remind us of a scene, uh, another scene in Scripture. And it takes us all the way back to creation. When in Genesis, you saw the Spirit of God hovering over, over the void, and God spoke, and we know it came to be. The whole point is this. The way God creates faith is that God speaks, and His Spirit has to bring life to those words and make it come alive. What I want that uh, how I want that to, to be an encouragement for all of us is as we continue to pray for people in our lives who don't believe yet, knowing that how God words is his word has to be spoken, ask God for wisdom on how to continue to share Christ, specifically through word. Okay? Yes, through our deeds and our actions and so forth and loving actions and so forth and kindness, but ask God to help you continue to grow in how do I share 
about Christ through my words, to the people in my life, the opportunities that you're giving me. Because faith is created by hearing the word of Christ. Of course, the Spirit has to do his part to bring that to life. But we also need to do our part to keep speaking that word so that people have an opportunity to respond to that word and for faith to be created. So what now? I want to just uh, leave you with some practical applications. First, in response to God's word, like Mary, serve the Lord. Mary responds beautifully, Behold, I'm your servant. I'm a servant of the Lord. A fruit of faith, responding to God's word, is that you serve. Who is it in your life that God is asking you to serve? Second, in response to God's word, trust the Lord. Let us say with Mary, let it be to me according to your word. Let your will be done in my life, God. I trust you. I trust your word. I trust living by your principles. I want my life to unfold according uh, to your principles and your promise in Scripture, your promises in Christ. I want to help us uh, appreciate this just a little bit more. Where else do we hear a prayer like Mary's in Scripture? Don't you think the heart of Mary's prayer is like the depth of Jesus' heart the night that he was betrayed on that decisive night? Jesus is wrestling with the prospect of his crucifixion and bearing the wrath of God against humanity's sin. And what does he pray? Not my will, but yours be done. That sounds a lot like, let it be to me according to your word. Now, I know this is just bit of my own imagination, but I don't think it's unreasonable to imagine Mary praying with the love of a mother over Jesus many a time before bed, many other times and occasions with this theme of complete trust and surrender to God's will. In this sense, Jesus doesn't fall far from the tree, just in his humanness, being brought up by a mother who's willing to say, let it be to me according to your word. But meaning, the point is, Jesus is the point. We worship Jesus more. Jesus is truly even better than Mary. And he trusted as a fruit of placing faith in God's word. Third, in response to God's word, become like the Lord. Christmas takes on its true meaning when we rejoice in Christ being born in our hearts. That's what we see here going on literally and spiritually. Christ is born in Mary's heart. And so to families, a specific uh, just application, in our flesh and blood families, let's continue to prioritize not just raising flesh and blood children, but raising spiritual children who have Christ born in them. Let that be the goal. Let that be the priority. And and that that be our prayers to, to our God. And finally, just to the church on the whole, as we think of being Christ's kingdom, salt and light, find joy. I I hope it becomes a a joyful opportunity, a joyful occasion when you see an opportunity to be able to share more of Christ. Look for those opportunities. Enjoy throwing a friendly curveball into conversations this Christmas by sharing how you find delight even as someone who believes in science, that there's even more wonder that science can't explain right now. Find joy in explaining that Christmas reminds you that you have the brightest hope that reaches beyond this life. Find joy in talking about how Jesus and his word of grace have benefited you in excellent ways. And so in this way, like Christmas and Advent, be a happy and renewed time of responding to God's word by faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for leaving us um, a record of this scene of you announcing the Messiah and how he'll come into the world through Mary. And we see, Lord, a uh, 
beautiful picture of how you create faith. And so we ask, first for ourselves, that um, you continue to create faith in us. Just grow our faith as we hear your word, as we hear it through the word of Christ. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to become people uh, that really live out the, the true theme of Christmas, the message of Christmas, to keep sharing this word of Christ. And we ask that your spirit, just as your spirit created at creation, that you would create more and more faith, Lord, that we could be eyewitnesses to more faith being created. Give us that joy, Lord, while we're on this earth to see many more sons of glory come to being from the same source who's Christ and his word and his spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.